So I'm glad to be here and glad to address this issue and kick off the first of several talks in this area that represent different aspects of the Institute. And uh, so I'll speak first, and then Art Goss will talk about a portion, and uh, Tim Chang, and then Steve Denbars. Um, so the context, as uh, Matt mentioned, is that we consume a lot of energy today, and uh, we put a lot of carbon in the atmosphere. And uh, while we could work on, on generating energy, and there's a lot of good efforts here on that, for instance, in uh, Professor Heger's group, uh, we're mainly thinking that the big benefit, the big gain can be come on, on the demand side. And it's much easier to reduce the amount of energy we consume by a factor of two than it is to double the number of power plants and distribution systems that exist. So this is the global carbon emission uh, going on. And we're presently at about energy for a long time uh, called Sun's Law, which is uh, we're sitting here at, at consuming ours. And a lot of countries like India and China that really don't consume very much. But they want to move up this curve. And if they move up the curve the way it exists today, we as a society are in huge trouble. So Cohn's law is the, uh, the total energy consumption is the number of people times the amount per capita. Incredibly obvious uh, law, obviously. But, but the point being that uh, if you take a, a billion people in India or China and they consume that much electricity, we're all in, in, in a major problem. So the question is, can we, can we move where we are from out here up to here? So not reduce the quality of life, but consume less electricity and, and less energy in general. And some countries like Germany have been very aggressive about this and have actually been moving this way over the last couple of years. And it's a very impressive effort. Um, so if you want to summarize all they, they're represented here. So that there's a bunch of different areas we'll talk about, like degrees temperature rise of the planet would be made for everybody. Uh, particularly those living in the lower areas of Santa Barbara. So these are some of the things we'll talk about today. Um, you know, things like uh, replacing light bulbs with LEDs and improving building lighting and energy scavenging, electronics. I'll, I'll go through a bunch of these. And any one by itself is not sufficient to solve this problem. But rather, when you put them all together, the belief is that we can actually uh, hopefully attain the point where we don't actually put any more carbon in the atmosphere and, and get any more temperature rise than we have today but also have a higher quality of living, not just for ourselves, but for all the developing countries. So provide a path for them to achieve a higher quality of living without uh, a lot more uh, carbon in the atmosphere. So the mission, basically, of, of the Institute is to develop technologies that consume significantly less energy than what exists today. And uh, the real effort here is, is not just research, but also commercialization. So the goal is to interact with all of the other companies here and, and worldwide. So I'll talk about five different areas, and, and we've sort of grouped them together in, in what's listed here as strategic technologies. And there's a lot more detail in, in the brochure and a lot of professors involved. There's probably close to 50 people involved. And as I think men Matt mentioned earlier, there's probably something like $10 million of research going on today. Uh, and our goal is to greatly enhance that and really focus that uh, research uh, into energy efficiency. And so I'll talk about a few different areas. Um, obviously, I can't go into great detail. And, and, the, and the names of people working on it are listed here. So the first one, which is incredibly successful, is the Solid State Lighting and Energy Center. And Steve will talk about that in, in a couple of talks. So I don't really mean to say very much, but I did want to embarrass him a little bit. Um, so uh, I was on the search committee that hired Steve, so I'm very proud of that fact. Um, and we hired Steve back here, I think here. Is that correct, Steve? Yeah. Uh, so at that point, uh, blue LEDs were about 100 times less efficient than light bulbs. And no one really thought about using them to replace light bulbs. In fact, that was a really stupid idea at that point. However, uh, Steve and a bunch of other people and, and uh, was very instrumental at hiring people like Suji Nakamura. And all of them put together have a whole lot of invention, which is represented by all these lines. And today, we're at this point at about 160 lumens per, per watt, which is about 10 times more efficient than incandescent light bulbs. So obviously, at this point, it really does seem uh, smart to, to look at solving the remaining problems in commercialization and uh, stop using incandescent bulbs and use uh, not just compact fluorescents, but, but LEDs. So this has been obviously a very successful effort and a really good example of what research can accomplish. And if you put a bunch of people thinking about these problems, uh, they can solve them. And there's some numbers here that, that indicate what the benefit for the planet is, but, but Steve will talk about that in much greater detail. 
I'll talk a little bit more about a computer and networks area. Um, and again, this is something that's beginning to take a very large amount of energy. Uh, presently, we spend about $3 billion to power data centers. And I think you've all seen Google's installing data centers, Yahoo, everyone else. And they typically cite these on in places that have cheap energy, like Oregon for hydroelectric power, and on rivers, because not just do you have to throw a whole lot of energy in to drive the data, so you have to cool all of that. So uh, it has a big impact on our environment. There's various estimates about how much the Internet uses today. One common number I've seen from Rod Tucker is it's about 5% of the world's energy is consumed with the Internet. The problem is, as you know, the capacity of the Internet is expanding by, you know, doubling every roughly 18 months. So this number quickly goes past 10% in just a few years if we don't do something about it. And uh, if you talk to companies like Google, um, they've asserted, they mentioned in one of their reports to the analysts that they're going to spend more money powering their data centers than they are going to spend on servers. So there's some real problems here that we need to address. And, and that's what a whole lot of people here in computer science and electrical engineering and, uh, are, and mechanical engineering are focused on. So Tim Chang will talk about some of the aspects of, of this later. Um, I'll just talk about uh, some of the optical elements that we're working on uh, between Larry Calder and Dan Blumenthal and myself. This is an example of the kind of innovation we're talking about. This is a plot of heat flux as a function of year. And so we all know about bipolar transistors. And, and the real drive for, for low power alternative came when the flux hit some number, you know, 10 watts per, per module, something like that. And, uh, Obviously, the invention of CMOS came along, and, and we've had lots of progress. We're now up here somewhere. So now the question is, how do you make that next, what's that next invention? And there's a lot of different things going on, things like 3D architectures involving bonding planes of like memory above processors, things like this. And I'll talk about putting optics as one of those levels, um, the research that we're doing to make multi-core processors possible. Um, Tim will talk in the subsequent talk about sort of analyzing this whole stack of, of problems in, in one unified approach. So it's a very broad, cross-disciplinary effort um, in solving that. We've been focused on the issue of getting data on and off chips and doing so in, in a way that takes a lot less power. It's well known that the number of pins and the amount of power being consumed is a big problem today in, in high-speed electronics. And this is, happens to be a, an Intel slide about too much power, too many pins. And the question is, how can you solve that? And so it's well known that long distance transmission is all done optically because the loss for optical communications is far less than electrical, probably four orders of magnitude less. But presently, optics does not invade this space of board to board or chip to chip communications, certainly not on chip communications. And that's a big problem because the solution to the power problem, as I think Tim will probably get into, is not to go single core but multi cores. We all have dual core, quad core. In our, in our laptops because uh, multiple cores operating at lower speed takes energy goes like the number of cores rather than like the clock rate squared. So the problem though is that when you have all these different processors that have to talk to each other, how do you communicate between them? And uh, that's where, where optics can come in. So we want to move this transition line such that optics really does work on this level and perhaps even on top of a chip itself. So Herb Cromer's in the audience, and, and he wouldn't let me talk if I didn't show a band diagram. So here's a conduction band and a valence band, and it just illustrates here's the problem. We, we want to solve this problem in silicon. We want to have optical communication because it has lower loss, higher bandwidth. We can put terabits out. The problem is that if you put an electron here in a hole here, then uh, the electron runs over here to this lower energy state, and it doesn't emit light. It emits when this electron recombines the hole, it emits a phonon. And so that's a big problem, and that's why no one makes lasers. The whole optical industry is based on either indium phosphide, typically or gallium arsenide, or gallium nitride. The assertion we're having, though, is that if you could do it on silicon, if you could sort of use these very multi-billion dollar processing plants to make optoelectronics, you'd be far better off. Today, all three, five, all optoelectronics are made in, in either indium phosphide foundries or, or compound semiconductor foundries. Can we, can we do the whole thing in a CMOS foundry? And that's our goal. Um, so you may have seen the announcement about a year ago was the first demonstration where we demonstrated a, a hybrid silicon laser. We found a way to put layers of 3.5, so we didn't give up on, on it completely, but we're using wafers of SOI, 
and we deposit layer, crystal layers on here, and we can make lasers and uh, arrays of lasers and, and now more complicated photonic integrated circuits. Today we're on a four inch scale. We can do this on four inches and we hope within a few months to be hitting six inches and then, and then go beyond that. And uh, so that's, that's kind of, that's, that's our effort. And uh, this is an example of, of we're working now as well with IBM. And this is one of their chips with lots of processors on it. And this chip consumes 100 watts. And so the problem is you, if, you, if this is a Google using this server, they have a million processors. You take a million times this, that's a whole lot of power, obviously. And, and indeed, you know, data centers do consume megawatts of power. Our goal is to reduce this number. It's 30 to 50 percent, which is being used for the global interconnect. That's what we can get down. And we can cut that down by a factor of 10 if we do it optically. And that's, that's our focus. If you look at the data rates here, this is what they need to do, a terabit per processor uh, on this chip. And that's what, we're, that's what we're focused on. So this is, again, an IBM slide, but just shows the idea of you've, you've got a bunch of bonded layers, processor plane bonded to a memory plane, bonded to a photonic plane. So this is, you know, a few years ago they weren't really thinking along these lines, but now they're thinking about it and looking at putting optical networks on chip. And so we're collaborating with them on this, and uh, the goal is to communicate from, from processor to processor on chip optically. So it's pretty far out right now, but that's our goal. Um, a related goal that sort of illustrates the richness of this is to make terabit transmitters. So we need to make lasers, um, we need to make modulators, we need to make combiners and couple it to fiber. And this is something we're actively working on. So some students are working on modulators. We actually gave it a post-deadline paper today at, at the Optical Fiber Communication Conference on how to make di these distributed feedback lasers. So that, that's the general effort. A related issue is just overall, if you multiply this by large-scale networks, um, again, the traffic going through AT&T's network and what Dr. Kim is addressing at, at, at Lucent is is providing devices to provide this much data, literally, you know, uh, petabytes and exabytes of data. And uh, so this, again, is doubling every 18 months. And one thing we work is on optical switching. And optical switches take literally about 20,000 times less power than electrical switches. They provide less functionality, but the question is, you know, is, is there a net gain? And there's a session next week, a bunch of us from UCSB are going to at Cisco addressing power. It's, it's a green, Cisco's Green Symposium, and so Rich Wolski and, and others, myself, will be going there to address that. So that's one general area of, of the Institute. Another general area is, is buildings, and this is Igor Mezik and a bunch of people in mechanical engineering. And the point is that buildings consume a huge amount of energy today. And, uh, they're all relatively efficient, inefficient, and this, this room is relatively inefficient, right? It's air conditioned roughly to a given temperature. It stays that way whether all of you leave or not, and, and we can be much more intelligent about how we run our buildings. And so the goal is to combine mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, people who do sensors, with people who do controls, and have buildings be very dynamic. And when there aren't any people there, they're not lit and they're not cooled. And, uh, and again, a lot of what Igor works on is how do you get efficient mixing of uh, air in, in rooms, and he believes he can make you know, air conditioning you know, at least twice, if not much, much more efficient, actually. He says 90 percent more efficient, which I find hard to believe, but I hope he's right. Um, and so one section of this institute is on the general area of dynamics of energy efficiency. And it's integrated building systems, it's energy storage, because a lot of what we're talking about for solar power, wind power, uh, is, is intermittent. Um, it's about energy harvesting uh, in a variety of ways. And it's about data centers. And data centers are a very interesting problem that they're working on because there's no people, right? So you can, you can optimize these rooms, these very particular rooms, for lots of data but very few people. So it's a different problem than we typically address. And so this slide illustrates the problem that they're addressing which is a very complicated combination of a whole lot of different efforts, uh, from sensors to controls to, you know, mechanisms that open windows and, and so forth. Um, this is the green scale effort primarily going on in the computer uh, science area. And again, uh, working uh, um, Fred Chong and, and uh, Rich uh, uh, are working on with, with Google in particular and, and other companies in terms of how do you optimize uh, data centers? 
There's an effort uh, in Tony Evans and Frank Zock and a lot of people materials that how do you make vehicles more efficient? And this is particularly important because uh, if you look, well, here's a good example. Sorry, I ran by it. Um, but just the fuel consumption that's going on today. Uh, you know, in, in a way, we're lucky that it's only growing 3% per year because the amount of miles that all of us fly is growing much faster than that. But fortunately, as a result of previous work, um, we've seen this continual improvement in fuel consumption um, per seat, basically. And so this is kind of where we are today. And fortunately, as you can tell, it's factors of three or four or five better than it used to be. But the question is, what are we going to do for the next 50 years? We're not going to stop flying, um, but rather we need more efficient ways to do this. And the focus they have is on things like higher temperature turbines and more efficient engines. And, and uh, there's a whole lot of very, very high class work going on in the, in the materials department in, in, in how to solve these. Um, there's a whole effort of people in the energy uh, conversion, transportation, storage area. And uh, these are photovoltaics, it's thermoelectrics. You'll see Art Gosser talk about thermoelectric research in the next, slot, next talk. Um, some very good work in catalysis, uh, hydrogen generation, we won't even have a chance to get into, perhaps Steve will, um, fuel cells and batteries. And it's a very interesting work on very novel ways to, to do this. Um, I think you're all aware that silicon solar cells have gotten more and more efficient, and it's a big industry, and we're increasingly getting more and more power generation from it. You know, but the amount we're getting is very minuscule, right? It's, it's like less than a percent even though we get more energy from sunlight in an hour than we use an entire year. The potential here is huge. The problem is that solar cells today are far too expensive to be wildly used, and they're not competitive with, with uh, burning fossil fuels. So the goal here, uh, particularly Alan Heger and, and, and a bunch of other people uh, in the whole Center for Polymers and Organic Solids is, is to go from these sorts of regions out here, fairly expensive, low efficiency solar cells up here. And, uh, it's a bunch of very interesting approaches involving, uh, if you haven't seen Alan's talk or, or movies, it's, it's very impressive, you know, meter wide, hundreds of meters long uh, polymers and depositing, and far more efficient, far less costly than, than the way one makes silicon, you know, at, at very high temperatures and in wafers of very limited area. So it, it's very exciting, very far out, and, and uh, unfortunately, we still have a lot of research to do. And uh, Alan has some really good ideas about putting multiple uh, light bear, you know, multiple uh, solar cells on top of each other, which is what silicon has done. The real issue is how do you do that on polymer basis? And, and if they can succeed at that, they'll almost immediately, I think, double the, the efficiency from where they are today. There's a parallel session on, on bio-inspired materials, and, and so perhaps this, this section is covered there, but Evelyn Hu and, and Dan Morrison folks are, are doing some very interesting work at, at uh, sy synthesizing these uh, photovoltaics and, and other materials based on biology. And so this happens to be Evelyn's work. Um, but again, she's, she's using these compound semiconductor nanowires and, and getting, solving the, the inherent trade-off between absorption and, and, and collecting electricity together. And uh, knowing the fundamental limits and, and uh, this, they, 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 they could do something very, very breakthrough. But it's very preliminary, very early work. I will mention that there is a sustainable, sustainability effort at UCSB, and uh, the chancellor has been pushing this for some time, and um, there's a lot of effort at a variety of things to uh, reduce the, just practically the amount of energy we consume on this campus right now, and it involves installing uh, compact fluorescents and LEDs and, and a bunch of other things. So to summarize, there's a lot of things that we can do to reduce the energy we consume. And it may be in lighting, it may be in uh, communication, it may be in, in just the rooms, the buildings we exist in. And uh, these are all very interdisciplinary efforts that we rely upon a lot of collaboration uh, amongst a lot of different faculty and students. And fundamentally, we really want to engage a lot of companies here, because if, if it stays here, then obviously it's not impacting the world. So the goal is to, is to engage with, with you in the audience and, and uh, transfer this to companies and uh, not just affect the United States, but the rest of the world as, as India and China and the rest of the world improve their quality of life. Thank you.
Uh, from the time that innovation gets out into the community, goes through the policymaking process, and typically that's a serial process. Any thoughts on the Institute of uh, getting policymakers involved sooner in the process so they could actually have uh, maybe the front end of policymaking going on by the time the innovation is ready for consumption, that they're, they're already putting the works together to shorten that process? You're thinking like in incentives and things like that, that exactly. would, or credits or something that would. Yes. Yeah. So it's very perceptive, and, and I guess I agree with you 100%. Um, so we are involving people like Ernst von Weizsäcker on the policy end of things, and you know he's, you know, kind of the, one, one of the very best in the world at it. Um, so yes, if he, as we saw at, at you know 1982, I guess right there was a, the whole energy field as a result of policy really really kind of came apart, and a lot of our leads evaporated and. Uh, we don't want that to happen again. So he's leading that whole area, and I think there'll be other faculty involved from, certainly from uh, brand, if not economics. Um, I think we may get lucky here because there's likely going to be a regime change, and the next regime is likely to be much more sympathetic towards energy and these problems than the previous one. So even if we don't do anything on the policy end, I think we'll be far better off than we are today. But I agree with you, we need, we need to focus on it. And, uh, um, you know, Yes. Whitney. I guess in a related question, uh, obviously energy policy is an increasingly hot topic, and I think the United States increasingly is getting behind the, the green movement. Um, and many people are calling for much stronger or, or much uh, higher levels of investment, not only of individual companies, but by the government in funding a lot of these programs. Uh, I'm just curious whether you see a relatively near-term, you know, increase in government investment in uh, energy-oriented research and, and how you think that may uh, affect the, the buildup of the programs here at UCSB. So, yes, there, there is increasing energy focus uh, on the state level and the federal level. Uh, DOE has announced some new centers they'll be implementing next year, and uh, the state has a new, the IUCRP has recently added an energy focus to it. Um, the California Public Utilities Commission, I guess that vote is like next week, I think, right? Well, Mike Witherall's uh, right in the center of that. Maybe he could comment about yeah. that. So you're right, uh, the federal government's spending about half on energy research what it did 30 years ago, which, of course, um, doesn't make sense. And that's what's driven uh, uh, the state of California to develop its own energy policy effectively, uh, and as with stem cells, develop their own funding mechanism. Uh, so the uh, California Public Utilities Commission at their March 13th meeting is going to accept a proposal for California Institute for Climate Solutions. Uh, basically, which will be embedded in the University of California and private California universities uh, on some of these things. And that will be broader than, to get back to the other question, broader than just technology that we're talking about here. It will be uh, policy, uh, social, uh, social aspects of this uh, and other things. But to get back to the federal government, uh, no matter who is elected among the people out there, uh, they will have a different position on effective climate change and need for energy policy. So it, everyone in Washington is betting that that investment will go up. Uh, but of course, the particular flavor of what goes up depends on things we don't know about yet. So the California Initiative, I think, is $600 million? Uh, $600 million over 10 years. Excuse me, $600 million over 10 years. So these are not small increases. Um, follow up in terms of input that at least I would find interesting is that you have a lot of advocates, uh, I think, of this program here in this room, and I'm sure there are many others that will get behind this program. Uh, if there's some way to channel information to advocates as to how we can help support government initiatives for research, whether it's at a state level or a federal level, I at least would be interested in that. It's not always easy for us to understand you know, what programs to support and, and how to support them. So I don't know if that's an appropriate thing for the Institute to uh, delve into, but um, it, 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 it may help build advocacy. 
I, I think it's a good idea. And our, our website just went live today with this announcement too, so keep looking at it and we'll try to keep it um, interesting to keep coming back to. I, uh, I know we're all engineers here, or at least it's an engineering school, uh, but I think one of the uh, major issues with regards to the energy efficiency, uh, for example, uh, the uh, utilization of, uh, for example, compact uh, fluorescent bulbs is the aesthetic uh, issues. Um, anybody who's been to a store, uh, a high quality uh, store, knows that you cannot buy clothing properly in, uh, the, in a store that's lighted with compact fluorescence. It just doesn't look right. And uh, I was just wondering whether your energy efficiency is going to have any uh, feelers out or, or working with uh, designers or artists or, or uh, uh, architects to uh, better um, interface with, with what people actually want uh, and, and not just focus on the engineering. Uh, I think the spectrum of white light that is produced is something of great interest. Uh, maybe Steve can remember to comment on that during his talk. Um, we're, we're not fans of compact fluorescents here, besides what you said, they're loaded with mercury, and uh, you know, we, we believe that LEDs are the long-term solution, so. so I, I, think, yeah, I, agree. I think the lighting center is, is on top of that, and they uh, understand the spectral composition. I don't have the slide, there's another slide they have that shows that, but uh, yeah, way back here, red LEDs became more efficient than light bulbs, but living in a red world is really very uninteresting. Um, so. You can see that you know, all three major spectrums are here, but getting the right composition so it really does become appealing is, is a non-trivial problem. So to actually make good light bulbs that people want to buy and, and are cost effective is much more than just the efficiency. So they've got a lot of interesting problems they're solving in that center. So. Why don't we hear about a few more of the technologies we'd like to uh, get across to you, and uh, then we'll bring it all together for a discussion. So I, I'd like to invite Art Gossard. Um, to the podium, uh, who's going to talk about uh, engineered materials for thermoelectric power generation. So I'd like to tell you about some of the work that we're doing uh, to make materials for uh, direct uh, generation of electricity from heat. So there's an enormous amount of uh, waste heat uh, that can be used, and we think there's a lot of progress to be made in making the materials for doing that direct conversion to electricity. So our group here um, includes some uh, researchers, postdocs, graduate students. Uh, we're working both here at Santa Barbara and are partnered with Santa Cruz, Berkeley, Harvard, and MIT in this process. We have funding from these groups. And uh, then at our reviews, we are getting inputs from some of the leaders leading companies in thermoelectric materials, and we're also supplying materials to uh, some companies that want to try uh, some newer, newer materials. Uh, okay, so how does thermoelectric power generation work? Uh, the basic idea is we have some material here, some kind of a conductor, and one side is hot and the other side is cold, that the effect of the heat is to uh, make the electrons hotter, to accelerate the electrons. So electrons will be a net motion of these hot electrons from this side of the material to that, and then I just indicate up in the top red to be the electrons that have arrived up there at the cold side of the uh, material. Um, now actually, if you want to make something practical, there's one thing more that you need to do because it's, uh, uh, inefficient to be, say, this would be your plus side and that would be your minus side, but the minus side would be cold and the plus side would be hot, and you don't want to have to contact both of those at these different temperatures. So you can do your contacts at the cool side by means of having uh, in series an N-type thermoelectric material and a P-type thermoelectric material. And the way that that works is that, okay, on the hot side, we're driving the electrons down to here, making this minus. The cold side, we drive the holes down here and make that side positive, and then a current can uh, run through our load. Okay. So, um, if you want to compare different materials that you're using for thermoelectric power generation, there's a generally accepted figure of merit, which we call ZT, it's dimensionless 
uh, quantity, and it depends on the square of the Seebeck coefficient, the electrical conductivity over the thermal conductivity. And uh, the Seebeck coefficient, that's just like the microvolts per degree. That's the thing you use in a thermocouple. But uh, having got that voltage, you want to be able to drive power. So you need electrical conductivity. If you're going to get current and get power out, you have to have a material that has good electrical conductivity. But at the same time, you don't want to lose a lot of heat just by thermal conductivity. So you would like to have low thermal conductivity. And this is the, uh, this is the figure of merit. Okay. And to kind of jump ahead to the conclusion, um, I want to compare uh, the, this figure of merit um, as a function of temperature for several materials. Okay, the common, uh, the lion in the field, the thing that's most generally used now is bismuth telluride, uh, lead telluride, compare here is silicon germanium alloys, and the thing we'll talk about here today is this composite material that we made of erbium arsenide, indium gallium, aluminum arsenide. And I'll have to explain to you what that's about. Briefly, it's small metal nanoparticles inside a semiconductor. And we can see that in some ranges of temperature that we can uh, beat the figures of merit of the other materials. And so then uh, a little bit more about the way that we uh, are trying to use that. Um, here again, we have hot and cold, and we're driving electrons across. Uh, the little dots here are intended to represent little metal particles. So the reason that we put the little metal particles in is to try to impede the passage of heat. We want to scatter uh, phonons or lattice waves uh, or heat waves, if you will. And so by putting these things in, the lattice vibration hits the particle and gets scattered, and we can reduce the heat conductivity of the device. Uh, and actually, also, these little metal particles can act as dopants in the semiconductor. Literally, they can contribute in the right semiconductor. They can contribute their electrons so that we can increase the electrical conductivity at the same time we reduce the thermal conductivity. So that's the idea on our composite thermoelectric materials. And now let's look at these materials we actually make. We said the metal particles, he said, were erbium arsenide, or here, erbium antimonide is a closely related material. And this is a pretty beautiful scanning tunnel microscope image that our brand new faculty member, Chris Palmstrom, has made. Chris Palmstrom is a pioneer in this kind of material, and he's uh, just arrived here at Santa Barbara. Uh, and he's, um, in my lab, we're doing a lot of growth. Chris does growth, but Chris also does a lot of surface analysis. So he has a scanning tunnel microscope that works in an ultra-high vacuum. And so what's the material here? OK, it's a host of gallium antimonide. Blue there, we say gallium antimonide. So this is seen uh, at a scale as 20 nanometers. And you can actually see the surface reconstruction. It's a single crystal of material that's made by molecular beam epitaxy. That's the stuff that we do in our labs. And then on that is placed uh, about roughly a monolayer of erbium antimonide. And when you put this erbium antimonide metal on, the atoms actually agglomerate into islands. And the scale here is that red is just one monolayer above blue. So it's just a couple of angstroms above the blue. And so form these islands, these little clusters of metal. And they actually extend about three monolayers below the surface. So they're kind of like little icebergs one monolayer of atoms above the surface and three below. And those are the things that we're going to be relying on to um, use in our material. And um, just a little bit of periodic table here. Um, the erbium is a rare earth element, okay? And it's a group three, all, and here are all of the rare earths, okay? So they're all group threes, and uh, they form compounds with nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, and animal. Those are group five materials. So you know there are three five semiconductors. Well, these are three five metals. Um, and there's a lot of them. If you take all the rare earths and the four different group fives, you have over 40 different compounds. And they all have 
the rock salt crystal structure, same as sodium chloride. And uh, then for comparison here are the three five semiconductors showing their lattice constant, their uh, cell edge for the unit cell. And so these things match up pretty well so you can grow uh, the metal on the semiconductor. Okay. And so then a little bit more, say erbium arsenide, said had a rock salt crystal structure, and that's just an illustration of that crystal structure. Um, and here it lattice matches, and actually crystal matches pretty well to the semiconductor. The semiconductors have a slightly different crystal structure, the zinc blend structure, but the two fit together very well. So we can make the islands we showed you about. We can uh, uh, continue to deposit islands until they merge and form a continuous film. And that's illustrated here in a transmission electron microscope cross-section where we have started with indium gallium arsenide semiconductor and then put a whole film of erbium arsenide on it. Or over here, have put a particle and buried it or some more TEMs. Here um, you can see particles which have been then overgrown and then uh, more particles that are overgrown and more. The difference being that the deposition of the metal is bigger in each of these layers. And so as we make a bigger and bigger deposition, we get bigger and bigger islands, and ultimately they get, um, um, they uh, coalesce and make film. But we're interested more in particles, getting the semiconductor with the particles in it. And you can get particles actually by just co-depositing the semiconductor and the metal uh, constituents all at the same time. They're not soluble, so the metal prefers to form little particles, make nanoparticles. And the nanoparticles are very small indeed. So here um, in our, est uh, in our uh, transmission electron microscope labs, uh, student James LeBeau and Suzanne Stemmer uh, have looked at cross-sections of co-deposited semiconductor and with 3% of the metal constituents in it. And the little white uh, spots are the metal particles. And here they're just outlined for studying them. And you look at their size, and they're about 2 nanometers uh, along each side. The interesting thing is one of these particles then is about 2 by 2 by 2 nanometers. So it has about 100 atoms in it. So each, each particle has something like uh, 100 atoms. They are effective for scattering the phonons, scattering the elastic waves, because their dimensions uh, being something uh, in the order of five atoms long, they scatter waves that have wavelengths of five atoms. And so that means that there are, there are actually a lot of phonons that you want to scatter which have that type of a wavelength. And so introducing these scatters into the material is effective for cutting down the thermal conduction. And in fact, these are measurements for the thermal conductivity from our collaborators at Berkeley, uh, where they're comparing the semiconductor's thermal conductivity versus temperature, and then co-depositing 0.3% or 3% of erbium arsenide. You can knock down the thermal conductivity by something in the order of a factor of three. And so that's useful. Actually, this material up here, being an alloy, is, is not a very good thermal conductor to begin with. That's fine. But this is still much worse. So these are actually uh, kind of record low thermal conductivities for materials like this. Materials are still single crystal. Everything is single crystal, uh, but great for um, uh, scattering phonons. Uh, there's actually another benefit of having the metal particles, and let me try to explain that. Um, the, I've made a little diagram here, a band edge diagram, where blue areas here represent metal. And what's plotted here is energy or potential here, and growth direction, and this is meant to represent a series of particles or layers. And the metal, the blue, represents the energies of states that are occupied. You know in a metal that you have electrons occupied up to some Fermi level. Okay, so there's a metal and we occupy and there's its Fermi level. We select the semiconductor so that uh, its conduction band edge is a little bit higher. 
So there's a little barrier here between each of these metal layers. So for an electron to get from one of these to the next to the next or get through the material, the electron actually has to surmount this little barrier. And it can do that just by being uh, thermal excitation, just by heating the material. And this produces a filtering, which is beneficial. Why is it beneficial? It's because actually the electrons that carry the charge and do you most good in thermoelectricity are these hot electrons, the energetic ones, the ones that can just pass over these barriers uh, are the ones that are most useful for efficiency. Okay? So then with that kind of material that we've just looked at here, uh, we have been able to get this, this is the same figure I showed you before, but get a higher figure of merit. So what's different about what's been done before? What was done before, you'd go around looking for compounds. You, you know, you look for naturally occurring materials like bismuth telluride, and you try to deposit them in films and so on, get the best thermoelectric that you can, and you search for them. So the, on the other hand, what we're trying to do here is really to engineer a new material where we can uh, engineer the size of these particles, where they go, what the host is, and uh, so we do really what we call band gap engineering or making heterostructures. And we, we always like to quote Herb Cromer. Herb Cromer says, heterostructures for everything is his motto. And so we're trying, in this case, to uh, artificially generate these, these structures and give us just new uh, parameters and new dimensions and construction materials to work with. Okay? So then, how do you put these into a thermoelectric power generator? Uh, here in John Bauer's group, they're actually using or uh, fusing together both the new material and the old material. The new material works best at the high temperature and the, low ma oh, the old material at the low temperature. Okay? So put that to your advantage. Here's the heat source, the hot side. Here's the cold source. So in the part of the material that's hot, you put our material that's better at the high temperatures. and part of the material cold, you use the bismuth telluride it's better at the low temperatures. And then you can put a number of these things together into a module. So from here to here, um, uh, you generate the voltage uh, that you want, and then you put all of these things into series, make arrays. Um, and uh, say a word, though, about growing. It, one problem is to make these things good, you want to have thick, relatively thick films. And um, so the goal is, that if these are going to be practical, we have to have more than 20 microns of material. And typical epitaxial growth rates are more like one micron an hour. So we're ending up talking about 20, 40, 60 hour growths. And um, so one of our scientists is, is uh, you know, extremely courageous and has been making these, but it just takes a long time. So one thing we would like to do in the long run is to find faster ways of growing these things, or maybe other deposition techniques that could grow the same things a little quicker. But anyway, by dint of much effort, can grow them. And then these are just some of the uh, detailed conditions of how they're grown and what kind of an MBE system they are uh, grown on. And so that's the, some, of the, some of the issues of the materials. Then for the devices, here are some of the things from the Bowers lab. And, these things and in turn tested at our uh, collaborators uh, in Santa Cruz or MIT, um, or, and also, also tested here. Um, and so this is half of an MBE wafer that's been processed. And here you can see the thermocouples and the completed modules. Um, and, oops, let's go back. Um, and then this is output power. Um, for different heat source temperatures. So this demonstration device, we have up to five, uh, five watts or five plus watts uh, of output. Um, what's the state of the art, say, for practical things, for flying a thermoelectric power generator in a satellite? Um, you can get um, something like seven to eight percent efficiency. We're not that high. Uh, the the person, Gay Hong, who, who made this says he thinks we're a little under 3% on these. So this is not yet a record efficiency device, even though the material is record, the whole 
uh, structure isn't yet optimized. Um, but um, uh, hopefully with uh, the wide variety of materials that we have, there's room for uh, further improvement on this. And uh, your ultimate goal can be pretty sizable. I mean, the power generators and the satellites uh, notice 55 kilograms is up there flying today in a thermoelectric power generator. And so let's see, I don't really have time to discuss, describe this in more much detail, but I have one slide to mention that you can use these little metal nanoparticles also in a solar cell application of coupling together in series two solar cells that have different band gaps and are sensitive to different parts of the spectrum. And in this case, we put together a gallium arsenide and an aluminum gallium arsenide solar cell uh, working with Professor Stuckey's group in chemistry. And um, the coupling these things together, the conventional way of coupling them is just having a very heavily doped PN junction that lets one solar cell be coupled in series to the next. Uh, and it relies on tunneling of electrons and holes through the junction. Um, what we do with the erbium arsenide, the little metal particle, is putting that in the middle of this tunnel junction, we provide a whole new path for tunneling, new states that can make enormous increases in tunneling current and reduce the um, voltage drop. So here comparing a conventional tunnel junction from our lab that would only put out 1.2 volts, here we can get more, more than 2 volts, getting very close to the sum of the band gaps of the uh, materials. Um, so that's something we'd like to work more on in the future. So in conclusion, um, we've grown these materials, tested them, measured their electrical, thermal, and uh, thermoelectric properties, and uh, measured the, the figures of merit, and have been able to make uh, some of these first uh, demonstration devices. Thank you. There are applications of this kind of material for the reverse action too, right? Cooling? Yeah, exactly. So you can run uh, current through these and uh, produce cooling. And in fact, that uh, previous, the uh, project for this was one that John Bowers and his group had worked on uh, with the goal of being cooling lasers. So if you, the lasers will be more efficient if they can be cooled or they can put out greater power. So you can integrate on board the thermoelectric cooler uh, with a laser and uh, plus many other things. I mean, you can actually go to the store now and buy thermoelectric coolers for beverages uh, for your car. <laughs> you can plug into the, your electrical outlets on your car. Yeah. Mr. Baker. Are there any theoretical uh, limits to this? Uh, do you have any idea what, how, you, you mentioned something at like 8%. Uh, is there any uh, model that tells you how, how good they could possibly ever get? Uh, and I think that that's limited by the material. I don't think we're at, uh, I, don't, I don't know of any limit of the materials that's going to limit it to 8%. But, uh, so, I, so I don't really know the answer to your question, but I would think that uh, you know, 20 to 40% is not impossible. John. As the Carnot efficiency would be the fundamental limit. We can't do better than that. But we're, as Art says, we're nowhere close to that. So I think we can indeed get to 30 or 40 percent. Right. Any further questions or comments? Last comment is, you know, uh, Steve Danbars and folks have done so well at solid state lighting. Our goal here is at some point to make solid state refrigerators, as an example. Um, but we're a long way from where we need to be on efficiency. Yep. Thank you, Art. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to invite Tim Chang, who's the chair of our ECE department, to talk about uh, energy efficient computing. In the next 30 minutes, I intended to give a quick overview of the low power and uh, energy efficient design technique across the electronic design hierarchy, ranging, ranging from circuit techniques to architecture and uh, system optimization. Um, the low power electronic design is not new at all, has been there for more than 10 years. The main motivations have been the 
extending the battery life for mobile and the embedded applications, and uh, also for reducing the heat problems generated by the electronics. And this will continue to be the important motivation for low power design. But more recently, energy management has been has become a critical issue for servers and for data center operation. At this point of time, the focus has been on reducing the cost related to energy issues such as capital, such as uh, operating expenses and uh, environmental impact. So what I'm going to do is introduce a set of techniques and the purpose of discussing those is to show that many of the techniques applied in the past in the electronics or lower level of design abstraction for optimization can now be explored to meet the new demand. Now, this chart shows the power consumption trend um, <coughs> given the, uh, by the professor in the University of Tokyo. He actually lists a small segment of the electronic system, which is microprocessor and the DSP. And they show the power consumption for the design published in ISCC, which is a premium conference of IC design. So you can see that before 90s, for each generation, which is three years, the power increased by a factor of four. But after 90s, when power and the heat become the limiting factor, the state of the our microprocessor, the power consumption as, as flattened now increased by 40% because we already reached the level of 100 watt or 150 watts. Just give you a uh, comparison that uh, talking about hot plate, the power density is about 10 watts per centimeter square. If you're talking about 200 watts per centimeter square power density, it's equivalent to a nuclear reactor. So we are reaching there. Beginning of the century, we have a new enemy, which is a leakage current, which was not an issue at all. When I was a student, we were told the beauty of CMOS is that with the transistor not doing the work, it consumes no power. But now when we reach 90 nanometer or even below 65 nanometer, leakage current actually become a dominating uh, power factor. Here is a hypothetical microprocessor example which operate within the range of 1 volt to 1.2 volt. If you look at the total power consumption, the leakage current actually dominates. And there are other bad factors. When you increase the voltage, the leakage current increase, increase much faster. And not only that, if for the same type of chips coming out from the manufacturing line, different chips has this dramatic different variation in leakage current. So managing the leakage current is an important uh, consideration for energy efficiency and power optimization. In addition to the active power minimization has been, which has been the main target for many years. This slide is very busy, but the purpose is to show you that there has been tremendous effort in the past 10 years for different power optimization techniques, ranging from device engineering to circuit level to microarchitecture level, architecture level, to the server level, all the way to algorithm software, the, even to the workload and the service level. And each level has a bunch of techniques that can help to reduce the power. For example, starting from device engineering, use strand silicon to improve the mobility, using high K material to reduce the gay leakage, and use nitrogen doping to um, reduce the junction leakage, etc. Has been ap applied widely. Once you come to the circuit level, there are ideas such as sleep transistor, power gating, clock gating, and uh, use multiple threshold transistors and use voltage island. And I can, I'll give a brief overview for this set of techniques. 
Then if you move up the layer of uh, design abstraction, once you get to the architecture or even system level, the idea of dynamic voltage scaling and dy dynamic frequency scaling help a lot to reduce the power. And uh, going up to the software and algorithm, you can select low power algorithm. You can avoid using so-called hot instructions or even just reordering the instructions help to reduce the power. At the service level and the workload level, <coughs> If you just redistribute the task to the server, it actually helps balancing the thermal effect as well as reduce the total power consumed in the server. So let's start with some basic idea, sleep transistor. When we push for performance, what happens is the transistor used in the logic become leakier and leakier. They have a low threshold voltage. So when it's not doing the job, you still have current flowing through the transistor that consume power. So the one idea is to disconnect the logic from the power net and ground net when it's not doing any work. So it's done through so-called sleep transistor. By controlling that sleep transistor signal, you will be able to disconnect the logic from power and ground net. However, in the implementation, if this transistor is the same as the logic transistor, you add more leakage, you are not helping at all. So instead, for the logic part, you use high performance, low threshold transistors to push for performance. But for the sleep transistor, you use high threshold transistor, which is low performance, but since they are not on the signal pass, it won't hurt the signal performance. So you have dual threshold implementation of uh, your technology, but this effectively puts some of the transistor into sleep. That helps to reduce the leakage current. If you apply this idea to the system level, the technique called power gating. In modern design with uh, hundreds of millions of transistor, you have multiple layers of power network. So you have a global network and uh, you have a power sub-network, they're used to supply the voltage to each IP block or functional units. So you can put sleep transistors from the global network to the sub-network and selectively disable the power to some of the blocks. And for example, for block B, which underneath is here is just represented as a logic, which get the power from this, you, then if you know that they will never be turned off, then you don't need the transist uh, sleep transistor. The concept is pretty simple and powerful, but the implementation is very, very complex. So there are many issues. First is the power gating noise. When you turn on and off the sub-network, it will inevitably cause power gating noise on the network, which may take microsecond or even millisecond to stabilize. I think about a three gigahertz chip, if it takes even microseconds to stabilize, you will lose a, good, a large number of clock cycles for the job. The second thing is uh, the voltage drop of the sleep transistor, because huge amount of current will flow through the sleep transistor when the block is turned on and the transistor has finite resistance that cause voltage drop. Current flowing through the resistance cause IR drop. So in order to maintain the voltage level supplying the logic, you have to raise the voltage level uh, to the chip and higher voltage translate to higher power. So there is a balance. And another thing is wake up latency. As I mentioned earlier, once you wake up the block, it takes a long time to stabilize the power network. Another thing, last item is the extra overhead for adding this sleep transistor. Plus, you often have to add a lot of so-called decoupling capacitance to minimize the oscillation and the noise created using this technique. Another design issue, such as how to apply this concept, either as a fine grain solution or coarse grain solution, you can do power gating all the way to a single gate if you want to 
but the problem is the, the advantage is better control, but resulting in large area and the leakage overheads. Each transistor you add, add extra power. But of course, gram look like it make better sense. However, it will be very difficult to size this slip transistor because if that feed millions of transistors when it's operating, it's very difficult to design it to meet the performance requirement. So in our computer engineering group, Professor Marit Sadaska, she has been focusing on designing this uh, power ground network for optimum performance to meet minimum power, but at the same time addressing all the design constraints I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> and this idea uh, can be applied a different form called voltage islands. This is a very common concept for so-called system-on-chip design, which has large number of blocks. Each one has different performance requirement. You can use different voltage level for each block. <coughs> So there are several voltage levels for a single chip, each one from its own voltage island. So they're disconnected from each other. And you can add a power management unit to selectively uh, turn on and off each sub block. And this concept can be applied hierarchically. And using this idea combined with the power gating technique has been shown to be very powerful for um, the power reduction, for example, uh, a telecom ASIC chip, for telecom chips usually they have large number of IP blocks, each one has their own clock domain. Just using two different uh, voltage island, one is one volt, the other is 1.2 volt, can help to reduce the standby power by a factor of half, and uh, active power reduction is 16%. To reduce uh, active power, a very powerful concept is called clock gating. Clock signal is the most complicated signal in modern design, and it consumes about 50% of the total active power. But the nature of system on chip design is we squeeze tremendous functionality into a single chip. So naturally, if you take a snapshot at a particular moment, only a small fraction of the chip are doing the work. For example, if the microprocessor integer unit is doing the computation, likely folding point units are not doing anything. And if you have a transmitter, a transceiver, when it's transmitting, probably part of the receiver is not doing any work. So the idea of uh, clock gating is in your clock tree coming from the phase lock loop, you add some control, we call clock gating cell, in the clock buffer. It's controlled by digital signal. If you can predict certain modules or blocks in the your circuitry are not doing any computation, you just suppress the clock from reaching the destination. So you effectively avoid the register to do unnecessary latching or unnecessary work. That's the idea. And the the advantage of this technique is the resumption of the clock is very fast. It's different from power gating. It takes a long time to connect the power, disconnect the power from the logic. This is suppressing the clock. If you want to resume it, you can directly pass the clock within one cycle. So clock gated module can return to the ROM mode without loss of services. And this idea, if you find, apply in the finest grain, here's the example I uh, want to show. The left-hand side is the standard hardware description language called Verilog. If the designer basically say, well, when the clock arrives, if the enable signal is high, you load the data. So today's synthesis tool will automatically map that into a logic like this. You have fifth flop controlled by the clock, and this is multiplexer if enable is high, it's asserted, data is loading to the fifth flop. Otherwise, it's still loading, but loading is old value. So the fifth flop keeps doing the work. But very simple clock gating concept can be applied that if enable signal is high, you suppress the, suppress the clock from reaching the register. So the register will not do any loading if the enable is not asserted. So this is a low power version. This has been in the synthesis tool for many years. 
But what I want to show you is this simple idea can be explored to the extreme for the benefits of low power. Let me take an example. <coughs> this hardware description language basically saying let's Based on, when clock arrive, let's let select and then these two data into the three registers. But based on the contents of this enable signal, I select one of these two data to the output. So only one of these two will be useful at the output. So if we implement this, latching the data into one of these two registers will be wasted. It's redundant because they're not useful at the output. So understanding this design nature, what we can do is before the flip flop, we add a clock gating cell. Kind of use this signal to suppress one of the clock from reaching the register. So avoid unnecessary latching. And this, you compare these two design, the functionality is identical, but this is low power. But this is still pretty trivial. I can keep showing you. There are a lot of analysis you can do. <clears throat> there is an example. Suppose you have a design with this architecture. The clouds here represent the logic. And as earlier I showed you, if this is a register, you saw this structure, you will be able to do the clock gating to avoid unnecessary latching of the data into the register. But now you do a more advanced analysis, you will find that if I don't update the value here, there is no reason you need to update the value here because this logic depends on this. And similarly, if there is no update on here, you don't need to update here. And the update of this register depends on the update of these two registers. If nothing being updated, you don't need to update. So I can add clock gating logic to avoid unnecessary latching of the register to suppress activity. That's the whole idea. But I think I already either excite you enough or bore you enough. I'm going to skip, skip all the advanced example. But this technique is a perfect example that you take a very simple idea, but you do analysis your functionality. And the goal is to improve the clock gating efficiency, where the e clock gating efficiency is defined as the average percentage of time each register is gated. So, meaning, if you take a design and you look at all the registers, and some of the register, you could suppress the activity. So the percent, the bar here means this fraction of the time the register will be prevent from doing redundant work. That's a good saving. So the average number is your clock gating efficiency. And the idea I have just shown you is if we analyze the circuit automatically, explore the architecture, and identify opportunity to insert more gating cells, you will see more registers can be suppressed from unnecessary activity, or those are activities already being suppressed to some extent, you will see better, even more improvement. So the overall clock gate efficiency is much higher. Does this idea work? Actually, this has been employed in the 3D, high performance 3D graphics, which has a lot of pipeline stages. So this idea is particularly powerful. What has been shown is, originally the design has been inserted a lot of gated uh, clocks gate itself manually by the designer. But then you use tools and algorithm to employ more advanced insertion of the clock gating. You get more cell, uh, clock gating cells, so the logic, the size will be larger. So you have an area overhead about 0.8%. But doing so, you can reduce the peak power by 34% and idle power by 69%. Okay, now let's move on to the architecture and the system level. There's a very common idea called dynamic frequency and the voltage scaling. 
The idea is the following. If you complete a design and the target clock frequency is normalized to one, and the corresponding power consumption for that operational frequency also normalized to one. If for some reason you don't need to complete the task that fast, you just slow down your clock frequency for that particular design, you can gain cubic reduction in the power consumption because the power is proportional to frequency and uh, voltage square. You reduce the clock frequency, F reduce linearly. But since you're running it slower, you can reduce the supply voltage, uh, still making the chip work. So all this compound effect result in QB reduction. So if you don't need to hustle, then just relax and just it sells you a lot of energy. That's the whole idea. And this implementation can be done through software and hardware collaboration. Given the task running on a hardware platform, if you implement this called dynamic scaling algorithm, either in hardware or software, to predict what is the real deadline for completing this job, and then specify the required speed to the embedded controller, and the controller then will turn the knob of both clock frequency and the power supply voltage to adjust your hardware. And that has been proven extremely powerful for processor uh, power reduction. So specifically, let me show you the idea of dynamic voltage scaling. If you look at particular program you run in the microprocessor, if you for set the voltage level at its designed uh, nominal value, the utilization, a sample utilization is shown here that during this period of time is doing the running and then, then idle until the next segment of job coming in, etc. But now if we recognize that their idle time and you don't really need to complete the job that fast, then on the fly you adjust the voltage level, reduce it so the ex execution of that segment of program will be slower. But overall, at the end, the energy consumption will be much lower than the total energy used. And you're still meeting the deadline of the task. And the, this, this is the idea of dynamic voltage scaling on the fly and this collab, collaboration between software and hardware. And this algorithm can be implemented either in on-chip hardware or even in the software form. But I want to show you an even more interesting idea, which is push this idea to the limit. If I run microprocessor, if I use the dynamic voltage scaling, for a given required frequency you need to run, dynamic voltage scaling will tell you maybe you, you have to set a voltage at two volt. And that guarantee the chip will work. It's run at, at this particular frequency. And this voltage usually is uh, slightly higher than the zero margin point because it tolerates some noise. But this idea of so-called razor uh, dynamic voltage scaling, razor DVS, is purposely running below this zero margin level. What happened is if you continue to reduce your voltage, the circuit fail. But the error rate is relatively low in this range because typically when you design digital circuitry, only small number of critical passes. When you run special data, the critical pass exercise, and you need to guarantee the success of the computation, then the voltage has to be higher than a certain level. If you reduce a little bit, then occasionally you will latch the wrong data. But this technique is saying, let's run in that range, but let's build in some error recovery mechanism to recover the, from the error. And if the amount of hardware and energy you build in to recover from the error 
is smaller than the air, uh, total power assumption gained due to the voltage drop, it still pays off from power's point of view. So let me sh show you an animation how this idea works. Is you have a register here and some an adder doing the calculation and the additional logic which is relevant for this illustration. And they are con this register are controlled by this clock waveform. So suppose the adder two operands are five and four. And it takes a certain amount of time to propagate through the logic to get the data at the output, at the input of the next level of register. But if your voltage supply is too low, the amount of time needed to complete this computation is longer than the clock period. What happened is when this register latched the data, it latched the wrong data. Right, so an error occurred. And shortly after we latch the data, the correct data stabilized because it takes longer than the clock period you need to do the computation. But what you can do is you add a hardware called shadow register. This is the second register whose clock signal is a delayed version of the original clock. And one simple technique is you use the folding edge to latch the data. In other words, you give a clock, one and a half clock cycles to allow the propagation from here to here. Only one clock cycle for this part, but one and a half clock cycles to this pass. So almost you can guarantee this get the correct results. So you get correct results. Then in the hardware, you also build in a comparator to compare these two. If they're different, you know something was wrong, latch in the main data pass. And the hardware has some building mechanism to transfer the correct data before you do the further computation. There are a lot of design details in order to implement this concept, and it, but it has been proven to be powerful. The whole effect of this call uh, Razor DVS idea is the following. This chart, horizontal axis, the decreasing supply voltage, and the vertical axis, the total energy. In the past, what we're doing is we try to reduce it so that lowest curve is the ener consum energy consumption corresponding to the voltage supply. At some point, the chip fell. There's no zero error rate. So traditionally, we cannot go beyond a certain level. But now, with this idea, you can add additional circuitry to do error detection and error recovery to deal with small fraction of error, which will allow you to further reduce your power supply voltage, continue to drop it. So the second curve, second bottom curve is the energy curve with respect to the, oh, after you add the additional hardware. But that's not a whole story. Another point is the energy required to recover the error which you introduce. At a very error, low error rate, the energy consumption to do that recovery is relatively low. But if you push it too much, you need tremendous amount of exponential growth of energy to do the error recovery, which no longer makes sense. So if you combine these two curves, you will find the optimum point is here, where the corresponding power supply voltage is much lower than what you, have, you were able to do without accepting the error in your system. Okay, now let's move up one more level about server. Today, if you look at most of the power usage and energy efficiency in the server, it doesn't look that good. The top curve is the server power usage with respect to utilization. And this is normalized, means if the fully utilized, the power is 100%. But even if the server is doing nothing, it's just idling, in this particular case, it still consumes 50% of the power. 
So if you take the value of the utilization divided by the corresponding power usage, that gives you this lower curve we call the energy efficiency. That means to complete a unit utilization, how much energy you need to spend. You can see that the best utilization is you let the server doing the job all the time. That gives you the best energy efficiency. But typically, the server operating only at between 10 to 50 percent range of utilization, where you can see the energy efficiency is really low. Google has been trying to push the idea of so they give the name called energy proportion server. If you could design a server which, whose power consumption is completely proportional to the utilization, means when it's idle, it's 0%, when it's fully operating, it's 100%, then you will get the highest energy efficiency. But today, we're not there yet. So what they're talking about, actually, is measure the efficiency based on the electronic devices, so-called dynamic power range, which is defined as the difference between peak power and idle power, but we normalize with respect to the peak power. So for example, the, this one, the dynamic power range is 90%. And this one is 50%. You want this number as high as possible to maximize the power efficiency. But you look at the various electronic devices of today, microprocessor actually doing pretty well. State of the art processor has almost 70% of dynamic power range. Other devices, such as DRAM, is less than 50%. If you look at disks, it's about 25%. Network switches is only 15%. It's a long way to go. But you look at today's products for mobile and the embedded system. Almost most of the devices has more than 90% dynamic power range. Right, the idling time of your cell phone, the energy consumption versus the hours cons power consumption during the talking time is at least 10 to 1, or 1 to 10 ratio. Why? Because the design devices has been optimized from system all the way to, to single elements, components. But for our computing servers, for our data centers, we haven't explored that yet. If we, all the server can achieve 90% dynamic power range, Google's estimation is that their data center energy can be cut by at least half. And that's where the opportunity is. So, so f by now, I only talk about he. I only talk about the power for servers. But even bigger problem is heat generated by the uh, servers. We're talking about 100 watts or 150 watts per chip. This heat not only costs more because this is the chart uh, from this packaging roadmap. It's showing that if a single device reach more than 70 watts uh, power consumption, the packaging cost will grow exponentially. And we are already we are reaching that place. If you open up your desktop, you will find the for cooling the microprocessor is enormous complicated. And it also has other reliability, stability issue. So, you see, uh, so even at a chip level, analyzing cooling and doing servo management is extremely important. And uh, Professor Costa Banerjee has been working on how to do the chip level thermal analysis and provide that information back into the design process to do thermal balancing within the chip. Finally, I, I want to sh talk a little bit about data center. I think I should conclude in two, three minutes. I know Matt is looking at me. <laughs> uh, we have been asking ourselves, saving power for data center, how much it helps the energy? How much it helps for the environment? <clears throat> if you look at the power usage in data centers, it's not only for the server. It also has other 
uh, equipment such as disk data storage and network equipment. Each of them require power. And each set of equipment also come with associated uh, cooling and uh, other equipment to remove the heat. We don't have, actually I tried really hard to find data, but the most credible source of data I found that uh, published earlier uh, uh, last year, February last year, which showed that only for the server part. And by the way, s server is about only 10 to 15% of the microprocessor market. Uh, the other 85 to 90% are desktop and mobile market for the microprocessor in terms of number of units. So we're only talking about 10 to 15% of the microprocessor market and using data center. As of 2005, the power consumed for the server and the associated cooling accounts for 1.2% of U.S.'s electricity consumption, 1.2% and which is double from year 2000. And this number actually exceed the electricity consumption for household color TV. And this doesn't include the desktop, the one you use at the house, it's not server. And worldwide, I think it's 0.8%. So it does account for a lot, but if you look at the data center operation, the design principle even up today is very pessimistic based on the worst case. If you have experience you walk into the machine room, the server room, it's always freezing because you have to sup <laughs> supply enough cooling uh, to cover the worst case. And the worst case seldom had to happen. So we really need to have dynamic smart cooling which continuously monitoring the similar situation and utilize on-demand cooling infrastructure and dynamic allocating cooling, and even doing temperature aware load control, migrating the workload from server to server, balancing the thermal profile in not only in the chip level, but also in the rack level, in the data center floor level. So to summarize, I think I gave a brief introduction at uh, techniques at different level, but I hope I carry the message that many of the techniques which I introduced at this level could be applied at the higher level of the design hierarchy. And they can be broadly employed, uh, maybe in a different way, but concept will be the same, and I believe it hasn't been done. For example, the dynamic voltage scaling, dynamic frequency scaling, the whole idea is doing the adjustment on the fly. But in the system levels right now, most of the tech still done in a very static way. So how to add build, uh, building special control and looking at the cooling resources, cooling at the workload distribution, all this is a knob you can turn and plus the, the sensor technology to, to sense the temperature situation, I believe there is a a lot of research opportunity to allow us to vertically integrate it in this Energy Institute. I will stop here. Thank you. Somebody asked about the, uh, the quality of uh, LED lighting as compared to compact fluorescent, so I thought I ran back to my lab real quickly. Orin saw that I had time to get you uh, one of the LED light bulbs. This is a 60 watt replacement. LED light bulb and has a better color rendering than the compact fluorescent you now get in the stores. Unfortunately, you can't buy this yet. This is still uh, R&D prototypes. Uh, however, there are several that you can buy. Almost all the LED lighting you can buy today is over the internet, believe it or not. There, you can't go to Home Depot and buy this stuff, but there are several direct suppliers over the internet. And, and I just learned uh, today from Oren, Livni just told me they just replaced the first three sets of street lights on the campus with LED lighting. And as I drove back to my office, indeed, I looked up and all the street lights, the first three street lights coming on the campus, right you, yeah, right outside my window. I, I was gone for the last week. I guess it happened during the last week uh, because it, it, it was, uh, I knew it was coming. I didn't realize it was coming that fast. Uh, so anyways, that hopefully addresses some of your concerns about LED lighting being able to deliver the, the, the quality of lighting. Oops. Uh, at eight or eight, is there a 
there it is, laser pointer here. So I'll be talking about uh, energy efficiency, particularly what we believe is the, um, the use for sustainable solid state lighting. And uh, I work in the solid state lighting display center. The SSLEC is one of the largest institutes in the world dedicated towards solid state lighting. We also are blessed with having one of the largest clean rooms uh, at any university with over 13,000 uh, square feet. We have world-class um, MOCVD and MBE capability here, uh, shown here. And these tools, we have over 13 of these tools. Each one is about a million dollars. So we have over, just for our center, we have 13 million. Plus in the clean room, we probably have about $25 million in equipment we bought over the last 10 years for, for various programs here, some of John's programs and the Optical Electronics Technology Center has really you know, provided us with a well-stocked clean room. Uh, so we have full test capability, full packaging and prototyping. Um, we're primarily industry sponsored, uh, believe it or not, and this was driven uh, largely to the, the fact that the Department of Energy was not sponsoring solid state lighting when we started this center uh, over uh, five years ago. However, now they're starting to sponsor it and I'll be showing some of the, the research results in collaboration with a, a very large group. So we have over nine faculty in our activity here in the uh, Energy Center. Uh, over 63 total people work full time on this project. Uh, as you can see, a wide range of both uh, students, visiting researchers, and staff. And uh, we're typically cranking out about uh, eight to 10 PhD students a year. Uh, and they've all been pretty successful at getting uh, jobs in the current uh, environment. So I like to show this graph. This is kind of a historical uh, evolution of lighting efficiency. And lighting efficiency is actually measured in something called lighting efficacy, which measures the lumens, which is what you see, divided by the watts in. And uh, the incandescent light bulb uh, was invented back here in the 1870s by Edison. And it's pretty much been stuck at about 15 lumens per watt for the last 100 years. This is the dominant source of lighting technology in the world. In the US, it makes up about 70% of the lighting technology. In the rest of the world, if you count the rest of the world, it's about 85%. This is where the uh, fluorescent light bulb is. And actually, compact fluorescents actually add only about 55 lumens per watt. So that's, it's about right here. Uh, so fluorescent lighting technology, as you can see, has been the dominant white lighting along with metal halide for the last, uh, I'd say, about 15 to 20 years in terms of efficient white lighting. And you can see it's been a, a very fast rise in efficiency for the LED. Uh, this built upon a lot of the work of our uh, co-director, Suji Nakamura, who really helped commercialize the blue and subsequently white LED in the early 90s. And the first uh, white LEDs were actually only five lumens per watt, and this is back when we, uh, were, we, we had already been doing research since 93 in this field. And I just want to show you that the fast progress, we've basically made a 30-fold improvement uh, in this 13-year time frame. It's, it seems uh, fast now when you look at it historically. It seems like it was a lot of hard work when I look back on it. But we're now at the point where we actually project we'll be at over 200 lumens per watt within a few years. And at that point, I think we can start to see a lot of light sources switch over to uh, LED. Another big advantage of solid state lighting is shown in this view graph. And what I showed you before was the bulb efficiency. Turns out LEDs are very good at putting light out in one direction. So that gives you something very good in terms of fixture efficiency. Uh, so if you actually look at what the usable or the system lumens per watt are, it's shown in the right column here, it means today that LED lighting is already more efficient uh, than the street lighting that we currently use, which was 91 lumens per watt. It turns out that because the light's emitted in all direction with current light bulbs, you have huge drops in efficiency. So already today, it actually makes sense to replace street lighting, and hence the university's looking at some street lighting. Several cities are now looking at street lighting with LEDs because that's one of the areas where the commercial payback uh, is, is on order a few years. So we have a huge advantage over uh, the, the street light, but even in compact fluorescent, which is being widely deployed, you could see we're actually five times more efficient because compact fluorescent is one of the worst in terms of fixture efficiency because it's got this big white globe which the light has to go back through. And so end of the day, they only get about 33% of the light comes down onto the table or onto the clothing store. So it's actually not that much better than an incandescent light bulb. Uh, and this isn't widely known. So, you can see we're dealing with some very big improvements in efficiency already. Uh, and by the way, this is with the commercial 71 lumens per watt. And what we've achieved at our center is 150 lumens per watt. So this number very shortly, within about one to two years, will be 120 lumens per watt. 
So just to back up a little bit, uh, what is solid state lighting? What is an LED? I like to, I always tell my mother, there are rocks that glow. <laughs> Literally, this is a, a crystal of gallium nitride or a, a, a salt, and you put three volts across it, and indeed it glows very bright blue. And this is how we produce our, our light from our, our LEDs. Now it turns out that that rock is made of gallium nitride here. This is a crystal of gallium nitride. And it turns out that the gallium nitride, actually when you alloy it with indium, can emit the full range of visible light here, almost into the red, uh, and we can add some phosphor to shift it into red. So I can show you here then uh, a series of these rocks. Uh, the first were blue, and then as we alloy the indium in it, you can see it goes to green, uh, a little bit more greenish yellow than yellow, uh, and finally we can even get to red now. Uh, and then finally, when you combine all these in a single chip, you get a white LED. So this is uh, really advantageous for display lighting, uh, for several other types of lighting, and it's, it's a nice feature of this single material system. Then I think somebody else, I threw this view graph in because somebody asked what can, can you guys do because you guys sometimes have a lot of input on policy and in the new uh, Energy Efficient Institute we should probably have a policy section because the rest of the world, uh, while California kicked this off by just in introducing a bill to ban the light bulb, uh, this legislation actually hasn't passed yet, but it spurred uh, Australia to ban the light bulb. They actually referenced this bill here literally 20 days later the uh, legislation in Australia actually passed the bill. Uh, California's still arguing about it, by the way. And the European even already passed some legislation on March 9th. Uh, so the U.S., we have some new DOE regulations which look encouraging to, but so far there's no strict bans and there's no subsidies uh, projected for, for LED lighting. So I hope with the new, I guess, regime that John mentioned, there'll be some, some good uh, policies that come out to help us uh, implement LED lighting. Again, just to kind of show you overall uh, impact of lighting and how big of, of the energy budget it is, it's actually pretty big. This is for a, a building site. 30% of the energy in a building goes into lighting. 22% of our total electric, electricity in the nation goes into lighting. So it's actually a pretty big chunk of the, of the bill. And the majority of this, by the way, is using incandescent light bulbs again, which are simply heaters that give off a little bit of light. Uh, they're only about 4% efficient in the best, best case. Uh, so right now we're actually at 50%. Uh, so we're not even up at our 90% theoretical. It'll take many years to get to 90%, but I'm now pretty confident with some of these newer technologies we're developing, uh, we'll get there. Again, just to kind of go over, you've seen the nice little LEDs, how small they are, they're robust. Uh, I've had a lot of issues. I had a, a, a lot of people come and say, oh, you know, you don't have mercury like compact fluorescent, but we heard you have lead. And that's actually not true. All the current LEDs by the high-level manufacturers don't have lead in them anymore either. There's just gold and gallium nitride, uh, none of which are considered highly toxic. Uh, so we don't have the disposal issues that have currently cropped up with the compact fluorescent. And like I said, uh, more efficient. The only thing limiting us now is the cost of these LEDs. This, this LED light bulb that I first showed you was uh, $50. So it's still too expensive for the consumer. But uh, using these three different sources, uh, we're finding ways to drive it down. This is currently 90% of the market share of white LEDs is a blue plus a phosphor. Uh, if you could actually do a UV LED plus a phosphor, this one would be a lower cost than this one by about a factor of three, believe it or not. And then the three chip solution, while being the most expensive, is the best for uh, LCD TV displays. Uh, we got a question. Uh, we can back up. They're, they're, they're specking them at 50,000 hours. We actually think in several applications they'll go 100,000 hours. So uh, compact fluorescence, typically 15,000, so we can go about four times the life of compact fluorescent. Uh, and like I said, if you don't run them as hard as you can, you can get 100,000 hours of operation. Let me just check. I thought I had the number up here. Yeah, I put the, I put the 100,000 hour up here. So the, the replacement costs are tremendous uh, in terms of you don't have to go back out and save it. But if we just look alone at the energy savings and compared it to the 60 watt light bulb, the LED light bulb will consume seven watts, uh, by the way, and this will then be uh, 53 watts of power savings compared to the uh, incandescent light bulb. Uh, so the Department of Energy has done numerous calculations on commercialization of these 150 watt light bulbs uh, that we've uh, 
you know, demonstrated in R&D. And these numbers, by the way, are just for the United States alone. You can multiply them by about five for worldwide consumption numbers. And you can see just in the U.S. alone, we would alleviate the need for 133 power stations just because so much goes into uh, lighting and basically heating up incandescent light bulbs. And like I said, these numbers are, get to be staggering when you consider it on a worldwide scale. This just shows uh, that the U.S. indeed is producing a lot of light at night and we consume uh, one-fifth of the world's electricity supply. So in our center and in our activity here, what have we been doing, believe it or not? Uh, we've been doing a lot of work on the material science of these LED chips. So this is one of those rocks that glow. And you can see we've applied some very sophisticated nanotechnology to making these chips more efficient. We've uh, made photonic crystals in collaboration with Evelyn Hu and, and Claude Weisbusch group. We've uh, implemented new contact material to it. Uh, Ram Shashedri and Tony Chinema have developed new phosphors. And we've actually even developed new crystal uh, orientations and new technology for the, for the base technology. Uh, so some of this work as a function of wavelength is shown here. This is the efficiencies of the chip. So this is directly a measure of uh, the percent of, uh, of electricity you put in, the electrons you put in, how much comes out as photons or light. And you can see we're now up to 60% here in the blue range, in this wavelength range. And in the, uh, as we push into the green, the efficiency drops quite rapidly. But recently, we've made breakthroughs in a, in a new material orientation called nonpolar gallium nitride which uh, is now giving us higher efficiencies at the longer wavelengths. If we can push this all the way across the board, 60% here all the way to the red, then we'd have our 280 lumen per watt light bulb. So right now we're at 150 just with this, this part alone. If we get these other colors, then we'll be at 280. Uh, so that's, that's kind of our goal for the next uh, five years. Again, this technology uh, of nonpolar gallium nitride was actually invented here at UCSB. We've filed many patents with the uh, TIA, with the Office of Technology Transfer, on these two different crystal planes of gallium nitride and, and become really recognized as world leaders in this new technology field. I threw this up here because Herb Cromer was in the audience. There he is. Uh, he says, you can never give a talk on semiconductors without showing a band diagram. I know this is a little advanced for the audience. But this actually shows you uh, in the chip the energy bands within the, the, the new chips we've made in gallium nitride are very flat. And we actually get very uh, well-confined behavior of electron holes. All the light in these, these LEDs I've shown you come out from five atomic layers of the crystal. If you don't grow it on nonpolar gallium nitride, you actually get huge built-in fields. And the uh, efficiency of the LEDs dies rapidly as you scale it up. So this new nonpolar, we think, will help solve some of those cost issues as you try to scale up these chips from small chips to things that light up rooms. And I just wanted to throw this one in here, because this is the history of, of nonpolar research at UCSB. You could see we worked on it five years uh, in the face of a lot of ridicule from the community, believe it or not, up until last year when the efficiency finally really rose up to the point. And we're now at 50% uh, for the nonpolar. And this amount of research, uh, I can tell you, took about uh, 15 PhD students between this point and this point. So it just shows you, you have to work on the materials a uh, long time to make breakthroughs in these arenas. And I thought I'd just conclude with some of the current applications you can see for solid state lighting uh, that you may or may not know. Most traffic signals in California now use LEDs for the, the light source. Uh, everybody's cell phone in their pocket uses uh, LEDs for the backlight. There's virtually no small color screen anymore that's not done with LED backlighting in combination with a, a liquid crystal display in front of it. Uh, street lights, uh, this was in Japan. They're now coming to the US. Uh, and the ones in the US are actually made by US manufacturers now. And then Samsung recently uh, announced a, a, a DLP TV with LEDs as the light source. And finally, about three automotive suppliers are now coming out with LED headlights. Uh, for improved fuel efficiency savings. Specifically for, for trucking industry, it makes sense to switch to LED headlights. It's about a half a percent to one percent energy savings for, for LED headlights. Uh, another outsource of our research is actually to make, you can actually use the same crystals to make lasers, three colors of lasers, and uh, laser TV is the next thing we think beyond LCD. You have to wait five or 10 years to buy this, but because uh, it's a little expensive now. But this is something uh, cute I thought I'd show that they're actually demoing some, some laser-based uh, TVs. And uh, hopefully, we'll get the cost down enough uh, that you can put it on your cell phone, and then you can have cell phone TV. 
Finally, I think some of the things we're also looking at is combining the LEDs with photovoltaics and uh, both Engineers Without Borders is an organization here on campus that uh, Oren is, is one of the members of and the students are trying to now implement uh, an LED with a uh, battery and a solar cell to bring lighting to the uh, third world. Yeah, I just thought I'd show this up here because basically one third of the world uses kerosene based lighting which has an efficiency of 0 0.03 lumens per watt and uh, the average villager actually spends about $50 a year on kerosene. So this is, this is like 30% of the budget of some of these people in, in uh, not only Pakistan, but uh, this is Nepal, I believe. And one of the advantages then, they can have clean uh, lighting at night, and uh, I guess in, in Light Up the World Foundation uh, installed LED lighting in one of these schools, and they said they basically children can study at night because now they have clean uh, white lighting. Uh, some other outputs, air and water purification, but I think we'll conclude with that, that uh, we think this is a, an exciting area for energy efficiency, very high energy efficient lighting sources. It's now in our labs 150 lumens per watt, uh, commercials at 71. Uh, as we progress and, and keep, continue to transfer this technology into the field, we believe uh, that you'll be able to buy the, the light bulbs at Home Depot sometime in the next uh, few years. Thanks. Good discussion both on issues around policy and technology development. Has your lab started to look at aggressively driving down cost of the technology? In a previous life at GE, the biggest challenge we face as the market really kind of bifurcated was uh, trying to get consumers even to be willing to spend the extra money for the energy savings. And it was a huge challenge given channel issues and everything else. So I think while the, the benefits on the energy efficiency are kind of blindingly obvious, trying to get the masses to, you know, um, realize that the, the initial cost of ownership isn't going to be extraordinarily high is, I think, a big hurdle to adoption. Any work in your area on that? Yeah, we're, we're working a little bit with the, um, actually with the California Energy Commission. They're trying to figure out ways to get the consumer to implement it. As you know, California is the number one state for implementation of compact fluorescent because they're heavily subsidized. In fact, there's many people that buy CFL in California and resell it on eBay. Uh, so uh, <laughs> this is actually, they're trying to short this, but this made California the number one state for CFL. So to, to answer your question, that is the biggest hurdle. We're working with our, our manufacturers have said the biggest problem is the scale up of the as we put more current in these, the chip's efficiency would drop. We've solved that problem in the physics recently in our nonpolar, so we're now working to transfer that technology into production. If we're successful in that, that will drive down the cost factors of five. Uh, so I think it will take some time before the consumer buys this. Uh, you can make the case now based on energy savings for municipalities. So it's going to be one of those chicken and egg things. You need, you need enough industry and other businesses buying it, like Walmart, that's the other big thing. Walmart just said they're switching all refrigerator lighting to LED lighting. And uh, they announced that about two months ago. And that helped drive down the cost of uh, white LEDs for refrigerator lighting, believe it or not, a very specific market. Uh, and they said their payback is actually only one year. So as these bigger projects get implemented, like the street lighting projects, if you get a couple more cities buying into that, then I think the cost, it's like any semiconductor, the more you make, the cheaper it becomes. But uh, hopefully we won't face the same hurdles that Compact Fluorescent has faced for the last 10 years, actually. There's another question back there, but let me interject. I mean, is, is there any sort of problem with uh, um, banning the light bulb, having massive adoption of Compact Fluorescence to the penetration of white LEDs? Uh, it's not a technical question. Yeah, is it going to hurt? No, I think it will actually help because what we're finding out is people switch to compact fluorescents, then they throw them away and they hate them, and then the, the LED solutions come in. For store lighting, that's what helped a couple of people get design wins in. Was, was there a question back there? Okay. Okay. Anything else then up, up here? Just wait one second, a few more questions. I think here's first. Thanks, Whitney. This is a very non-technical question. I, I recently have purchased flashlights that are LED. Mm -hmm. They're inexpensive. They're very bright. They're great. Uh, I, even some bulbs, uh, not a problem. But I started looking for this, some task lighting, these little uh, puck lights. And <laughs> the cost was amazing that you go from a light bulb, which costs 20 maybe $30, to these puck lights, which are like $150 each. 
And I, I totally did not understand the, the, why this particular kind of lighting was so much more expensive than another kind of lighting. Any ideas? Uh, I, I know the story on the puck lighting uh, quite well. Uh, you shouldn't buy from that company. They're basically a high-end designer that, that are charging for the design fees. You can buy a complete, is this for under cabinet lighting? You can buy under cabinet lighting for about $30 uh, if you go to the right source. And, and fine light's a good source, especially for desk task lighting. They have a, you know, some, some stuff. Actually, their desk light's a little expensive. It's about 190 so. It's, it's really just a matter of scale up right now. It, as you go to these higher lumen le levels, um, they become more expensive. The flashlight market, it turns out, there's lots of those size LEDs available because that's the same size LED you need for your cell phone. So the, the flashlight market went very quick because uh, it extended the battery life 10 times. So I'm not sure you checked it, but your battery will go for about 100 hours on an LED flashlight, and it lasts about 10 with the other, other types of uh, light bulbs. Good. A couple more questions. Professor Dunbar, this is a packaging question, more yeah. or less. But I was curious how you envision the transition between typical lighting in a house to LEDs where we have voltage changes and current changes. Um, are you doing any research into high voltage LEDs, or how will this transition be smooth? Uh, yeah, so we work with some of our companies. This one in here is a 110 volt LED thing, and they did all the power. Uh, so you just need a silicon power chip right on the package with it. So it is possible to keep it small, but like you said, it, it's still an issue. Another group just connected 30 of these LEDs on the chip itself, so then you got the 110 volts that way. Um, but nobody's decided what's the best way to go to the 110 volts. They work best at 12 volts. It's real easy to connect up. Uh, and like the LED flash loads, those are typically six volts. You just, so you just put two LEDs in series and then you drop your six volts. So another question related to the cost. Uh, obviously, the upfront cost of the light itself is an inhibitor to adoption. Uh, but I'm curious just what the, uh, you know, when you take total cost of ownership into account, roughly what is the, the current uh, uh, time to getting a return on your investment in the bulb, and, and how do you see that reducing over time? Because I, I, I think the upfront cost of the light bulb in a less green environment was a much bigger issue, but I think mm -hmm. that barrier could go down uh, more significantly, whether it through its subsidies or other, uh, j just people being more aware of the green movement. And so I'm curious on the return on investment, how long is it today and, and, and you know, Yeah, how I, will I know those be? numbers pretty well. So for a street light, it's right now three years. So that's why you can only get the cities to buy into it. They're out looking at a multiple year type thing. Traffic signals are very fast. Traffic signals are a one year payoff. But so there's no, and then for the, actually for the flashlight, it pays itself off in one set of battery changes. But there's, for the, for the standard home lighting, the payoff is still too far out. It's about five years. So it's a five year payout and you're not gonna get many consumers going, oh, I'm gonna start saving money in five years. I'll pay $50 now. So that's why I think some type of government incentive program would help here. There's government incentives for solar cells, as you know. We should be, have something comparable, but we don't. Uh, thank you, Steve. <laughs>